Um, I just wanted to just quickly introduce you. I know people probably know you, but just to say that um, uh, Noor was born in a small village outside Jerusalem, and I think the idea of village is very important to her, so maybe I'll ask her later about the influence of village on her work. Uh, but she went on to do her, her BFA at uh, Ramallah Academy of Arts, and then she went on to do her MFA at Cal Arts, um, and she spent a couple of years, or just a year, at uh, the Whitney uh, for Study for Independent uh, Center for Independent Study, uh, where she spent a year, I think, looking at Marxism. Is that right? What you said, and then returned to um, returned home and uh, kind of uh, found some of her, her her new ideas challenged and ch and and found them challenging, uh, but I think then responded in a way to the her landscape in a very different kind of way. And I hope you'll t talk to us a little bit about that as well. Um, and when, and uh, one of the things that she did was set up a place called the School of Intrusion, which I wanted to talk about later as well. And um, the, the last couple of years, she's been in a, in, in a residency in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, she's coming to the end of her residency, so she started in 2022, and she'll be finishing the residency now. Well, she'll go back to Amsterdam after this and um, finish her, her residency. Um, so. You know, in, in your work, um, there's a lot um, that you talk about uh, to do with um, mythology, history. For me, the sense of landscape is very uh, powerful. And um, of course, the idea of archives and, and documenting and, and what, that, what that means. Um, and I also feel, when watching your films, that the idea of um, this idea of history and mythology is very connected. And I. I wanted to ask you why, um, for you, mythology is, is so important and why storytelling is so important. And, um, but that I feel you see it in a very different way than a lot of people, when they think of mythologies, they may think of it differently. So what for you is, um, uh, you know, what, why are folk tales so important to you as, a, as, an, as an artist? And I wouldn't just say Palestinian artist, but I would say as an artist. And, and then maybe you can also explain why as a Palestinian that might mean something to you. Um, is it on? Yeah. Uh, thank you first, and thank you everyone for coming. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and thank you for watching uh, the three films. Um, for me, uh, folk tales, uh, stories, oral history um, is a general interest maybe of the marginal or the periphery. And because you mentioned the village, uh, so it comes from uh, there as a location, uh, what happens on the peripheries and the margins in terms of social, political um, structure, surfaces, how things move, and including stories, rumors, uh, jokes, uh, you know, it's different. The way the social structure um, builds itself, constructs itself and moves around, I'm interested in that. In terms of movement, as we see in the films, they're heavily based on movement. And then the, the oral, uh, which folk tales is part of it, comes as a layer that influences the choreography also for me, because there's no real uh, the narration in the films are uh, in the movement is the narration and it's inspired by the oral history around me and the um, how to say the the narration itself in terms of word it's mainly songs um, there is an urgency for me to document uh, so Doc, doc, using documentary form in terms of how I film, but not necessarily following the rules of documentary. So there is a sense of the um, mythic, mm, I'm not sure about the mythical as a word, mm. but there is a sense of the, let's say, the magical, fantastical, mm. the, the other, the other, let's say, that is mm. inside this documentary form. So, um, it's staged, uh, let's say performed, mm. staged, but filmed in a documentary sense. Mm. So the camera is always moving, is handheld. Mm. There is no um, uh, clear, crispy shots. Mm. This uh, this makes some interested mm. in. I don't know if I answered the. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's also about. I uh, mean, you brought the word choreography. So mm. the the pieces are, choreo are choreographed in. in um, in that you get you get uh, the community to go to these uh, different sites, and then you uh, you choreograph the pieces. But you call it social choreography. 
And maybe you can explain a little bit about what you know what you mean by social choreography. Uh, yes, it's a term I came across, um, let's say, nine or eight years ago, and I remember it affected me so much, and until today, I'm I'm still unpacking it. Uh, to simply um, explain what I understand from social choreography, it is how um, how can we through movement of the daily life understand wider ideologies, wider social political ideologies through observing how people move the way they move. And for me this was really amazing because it's like rather than imposing uh, bigger social political ideas on communities or societies, it starts from the inside out. So by observing how people move, we can then um, um, understand the the social and the political. So by like analyzing movement for me, so I go back to daily life movements around me and also other uh, ancient dances or dances like the last film there are two dances one with the warrior uh, the woman who is with a stick and the last scene around the fire these two choreographies are from originally from dances ancient dances in palestine that are still danced until today. The last one around the fire, it's originally danced with men, for example, in ceremonies like weddings. So they stand in line and they do uh, a longer dance. And I was amazed with one gesture of that dance. So how to re-choreograph an existing movement uh, and to re-contextualize it for the present uh, moment. So the act of hunting, for me, it it comes here, no? Mm -hmm. um, taking the from us, it's the same context, but how to recontextualize it in the space of the film with women around fire. So, how can we generate new meanings through re choreographing, let's say, or rearranging? Uh, it's interesting this idea of documenting, right? Because you're recreating and then documenting the recreations. And in this way, it's a performed, a performed. Um, and rehearse choreography of something which is ritual or something which is dance that is ordinarily done. I, I think when I was reading your book last night that you said that um, originally you had wanted some men, the men to do this choreography, but then, then they had rehearsed it, they had agreed to it, but at the last minute they, they decided not to. I mean, uh, can you tell us a bit about your process? You were saying that uh, the process was quite an interesting and long process of uh, of getting the community involved, and of course, it doesn't follow any set rules of filmmaking, <laughs> uh, even the process of filmmaking. Uh, the process of filming, uh, the, 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 sorry, the production uh, phase for me is the most interesting mm -hmm. because it um, it entails all the. Uh, family, friends, village, mm. everyone. And it's heavily based on trust, mm. observation, and a uh, friend of a friend and a friend of someone. And mm. you know, so you have to be uh, very much in the present moment. And this for me is an exercise that I like mm. um, and I trust fully. Mm. Um, so with the men, yes, I because I told you the dance is originally uh, danced by men, mm -hmm. so my first idea was like, let's do it again, let's rehearse it again with men. And I found this uh, group of men from another village near Ramallah, and I went uh, to see them, and we rehearsed together. They're older age. Mm -hmm. um, we rehearsed, they agreed, they were shy a bit. Uh, and then we agreed to go to the site and we took a bus because it's an hour away, the site. Um, and on the set with the camera, they got shy and they told me, we don't want to do... <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what do I do? You know, I tried to convince them, my father tried to talk to them. Uh, and I filmed some mm -hmm. with them, but I, it just did not work. There was mm -hmm. no... Um, I would say the weight of the feeling was mm. not what mm. I wanted. So, mm. you know, they enjoyed the trip and they <laughs> went home. <laughs> um, connecting to that, there's something else that you said. You said, um, and I, I kind of want to ask you more about, you know, what 
what made you want to explore in this particular way? You know, these story, the storytelling, uh, these songs, um, and in many ways, this idea of landscape. You know, and because this is a landscape which I think somebody said is in a way deformed by colonialism, and people are going to remember them in, in different ways. For, for myself, watching it, I, maybe for many Malaysians, I mean, looking at the sense of a landscape which is so different from ours, and that we understand imperfectly, well, many of us in, understand maybe imperfectly through um, the news, and now we're seeing it very close up sometimes, and then, and then at a very great distance, but the sense of something ancient and is, is very prevalent, I think, in, in all your pieces. And it's documenting something that isn't present, but actually was past, but is still present. That, that was the feeling I, I got. So I, I just want to understand a bit more you know, what you were trying to document and, um, and, and what inspired you to try to document that. Um, I don't know how to go around this question, uh, but I will start from saying um, this landscape is around me. Um, and it's, uh, for me, it's very um, normal to see. It's places uh, I cross by every day. This is part of my village and the surrounding villages. Uh, Palestine is ancient, no? And, um, I don't know. Uh, being like uh, being raised in Jerusalem, uh, you're you. I always felt we live in a parallel time. Like it's so uh, heavy, and um, uh, there's so much weight on that land uh, in general. And uh, put on top of it the direct uh, occupation, then it's um, the land itself is holding a lot, a lot of death, a lot of history, a lot of people who passed by, a lot of deconstruction, a lot of, you know, it's being, uh, being there's an attempt to def deform it on a daily, daily basis. And I witnessed this for all my, uh, for all my life. So uh, there is a kind of an urgency to, to keep, to document, to know, like I, you know, I know this land, I want it, I, it's mine, it's, you know, we come from it, we are the land somehow. So uh, it's, um, I always say, I always feel like uh, it, it is no part of resistance to be on that land. This is what we say in Palestine. It when is, say, say, that, say that expression again. Like just being on the land, mm. uh, it is part of resistance, mm. like mm. not leaving. Mm. I, I really, I dislike it so much when people in Europe keep asking me this last year, but is your family still there? They did not leave. And I'm like, why would they leave? You know, if we don't resist by our bodies, then what is it? So this is just to go back to the concept that we were, we always believed and uh, raised on the idea of staying, being. Mm -hmm. Underground, foreground, in between, we are there. Mm -hmm. So the land for me is the main character. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes to be, to be very honest and simple out of love, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like I'm in deep love with that place. Mm -hmm. And I'm recognizing it, and um, I maybe I create from that love. Mm. Let's say I want to see it. I want to discover mm. more and more. I want to go underground. So in the last film, I literally went mm. in the caves. I want to see what what is there. You know, all these uh, sounds I hear. All these uh, I don't I I don't call them ghosts. I would just call them spirits mm. like. The, the people around us that we cannot see, you know? So, yeah, it is, it's out of love, and um, I forgot the second part of the question. <laughs> um, maybe I can ask about, I think I, I read, or maybe you mentioned this to me yesterday, that um, you were looking for a site, and you, were drive, you went driving with your father, and then he said, there, this place. And then you got out and you you went to explore that that place. And I think you said somewhere that we did, we had a cigarette and decided this was the place. Uh, yes, this was in the uh, our songs were ready for all wars to come. The yeah. second film. Um, it happened that uh, he came back to the house and he told me, I found a place that you would like. Do you want to join? Mm -hmm. uh, let's go and see it. Mm -hmm. And I remember I told him I'm busy. I was teaching. I was preparing for the course. And he said, no, 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 you would really like it, just come, let's just smoke a cigarette. And it, it's five minutes away. And I went, and it, I never left, I think. We stayed hours, we smoked a lot of cigarettes, and I, 
I kept going back for a whole year of just um, observing being with and in the site. Um, and through this process of really uh, being in a site, I will I start creating by um, imagining or choreographing uh, the movement that comes from the site itself. So I cannot write a scene uh, for a random site or for a black box or it doesn't work for me. So the landscape again is the main character and uh, from the movement in it, then the movement of bodies come as a second step. So is that why the movements of the bodies in the second piece was very much those women peering into the caves? There was, they were lying on the ground and looking into the cave. So where did that come from? What was that impulse in that? You mean the small holes yeah, and women? Yeah. Are, are they holes or do they lead to bigger caves? Or Maybe can you explain to us, it's a very foreign landscape, that particular one, you know, just this um, area and then st strange holes in, in, in the landscape. Um, yes, so the choreography came out, I, I was interested and I'm still um, uh, in the in, uh, movement around uh, death and mourning in a social, um, in, in, in the community or in Palestine in general, how we move around the concept of death that is uh, a daily practice for us. Uh, that site is, um, that village used to be a kingdom and that site, the big hole uh, is a dried, uh, it used to be a pool, water, it's dried now. And the smaller holes, uh, they don't lead to a bigger cave, they are ju there is a, a hole underneath them and it used to preserve wine there and make wine. Um, what else? And there are other caves where the two women uh, hold a piece of fabric and enter. This cave leads to the big pool, for example, I discovered recently. Um, yes, it's very ancient, Roman era, it's mentioned in the Bible, I also discovered during the research. Uh, that uh, big pool, uh, dried pool in the Bible, it says that uh, people were fighting on the two sides of it and whoever is killed, they just throw them inside that pool, for example. Um, so the choreography came out of this research around social um, movement of uh, around death, and um, yeah, it's it's really hard for me to describe every single scene alone because it comes from a general feeling how to interact and to uh, respond to this site, to imagine communities uh, from before, but also to be grounded in the present. Uh, but with the with the scene you are mentioning, I wanted, um, you know, the head of the woman with the circle, the black circle, looking down. But they are so they're not dead, and th there is a subtle movement that they are doing as if they are looking to that void, or and the void is also looking at them. And we don't see; we only see the back of the of the head. Um, they are the whole scenes as if uh, they are they know what they're doing there is a whole ritual of a certain community that is happening on top of the ground between the dancers who are dancing these women with the holes the ones crawling from the pool and we see this uh, woman alone singing in the um, in the pool as if a call of survival or for mourning, surviving, and everyone else on top is kind of responding to her. They know what they're doing around that song, let's say. So they are in connection. This um, idea of uh, survival is so interesting, right? And you talk about the, the history that is so prevalent, oh, such a heavy weight of history in that land. So many, uh, so much has happened there uh, over thousands of years, and you can feel it. I mean, the sense that I get in looking at the landscape is is one that is very old. It, it feels older than my landscape, <laughs> I, I, for some reason, I, I don't know why. Um, and one of the things that you said, which I thought was very interesting, you said you wanted to ask in doing your films, can we consider performance as a method of survival? And I thought so, uh, that, that idea was very interesting to me, and I wanted to know if you could unpack it for us a little bit, maybe in relation to your films, um, how you think that performance is a method of survival? 
Yeah, it's a question that I'm still unpacking through my practice, so I don't uh, claim an answer. But um, the question uh, comes from thinking, how do we claim um, or return to uh, a certain landscape? And how does movement, um, can, how can movement be a tool for that? So in any communities, uh, for example, like choreographing rituals, uh, for me it's, um, it's a method of survival. Every community has their own rituals, their daily life, they are their beliefs. Uh, and through these um, performances of communities and movement, there is a certain claim for a history, for culture. No? And for me, this is what I'm interested in. So, um, you can see that very clearly in the first piece, in a very different kind of way. It's just a single person uh, performing a ritual. Uh, can you just talk about that a little bit more? You know, what, what that's your, that was your first film. What uh, drew you to make that? Um, and, with, and whether or not that was real fish. <laughs> were they real fish? What do you think? I thought they were real. They look so real. Um, Did they? <laughs> <laughs> What you, were they real? Yes, no? I, I thought they were real. But the, yes, but yes, they are. The flies were real, so I thought they must be real. And the cat was very interested. Yeah. Uh, the cats enjoyed this film so much. <laughs> <laughs> is the cat called Penelope? Who is Penelope? The, the woman. The my, uh, this is my mom. Oh, this is your mother. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So talk um, about this piece. It's um, I mean, even the process of making. I thought must have been so interesting for her, as well as the cats, of course. Yeah. So my mother stopped eating fish since then, <laughs> <laughs> and the cats of the village keeps coming back to us to. <laughs> That's the result of that film. Um, but to give it some context, that film was ten years ago. So if you. Uh, felt the difference, maybe, because I think, um, um, for me, I like to go back to it um, to also see uh, how how the whole concept of uh, mythology, um, even animals, uh, rituals, and performance, how, w how did it really start? I mean, I did works uh, before that, but for me, that uh, Penelope, that film really opened another door that I did not know it will. So the works that came after Penelope are different than the ones before, and that's why I like to go back to it. And Penelope comes uh, comes from the Greek um, mythology of Penelope, uh, the Odyssey, so it, it was very literal for me. And I didn't know uh, until I made the film, I said, ah, oh, it is Penelope. So I, I was very, let's say, direct back then, and the, um, uh, a metaphor, which I'm trying to get out to in the other films. Uh, so this is my mother. I had this idea of um, bringing fish. Um, it was uh, 40 kilos or something. And, <laughs> and this is our house. It's the, how to say, the extension. The courtyard, the courtyard in front of the house? Yes. Mm. Uh, but it's part of the house. It was very like independently made, self-produced, mm -hmm. really with a camera and my friend fil helping me with filming. And um, at 5 a.m. in the morning, I, we agreed, me and my mother, <laughs> to do this. Uh, so uh, for her, she was very, very excited to be part of the film. Um, so this encouraged me and it was the first film that I am not in front of the camera. Mm. Because before that film, I used to do performance uh, video and I'm always performing for the camera. And this is the first film that I put myself back and bring my mother in. Mm. So it was a study of also how to relate to other bodies that opened mm. many other bodies as we see in the other two films. I It was um, eye-opening for me uh, and I really enjoyed not to be in the frame. Um, it was hard for my mom to do it, and I remember I kept telling her whenever you're not, you know, we can stop. But she got into it. There was anger or something. She wanted to do it, and if you see her face, she's not happy actually. Yeah. She's, <laughs> she is, 
I don't know, she's in pain and she, these bees and the cat, and I don't know, it oh, was... bees, um, bees. They're bees. Oh, right. Yeah, she got a bite Stunned. also, oh. yeah. Um, yeah, then we took all that um, uh, thing she was making mm. to, the, um, to the desert area mm. that I also go back in the third film. Mm -hmm. um, and we filmed there a bit mm. and yeah. It was a very simple process inside the house. So this ritual of sewing uh, the, the fish together, is this based on something which people actually do or this is a, a ritual which you created? Um, uh, no, it's very popular in Palestine, uh, embroidery and sewing, uh, right. clothes, not fish. Yes. So it's... Uh, <laughs> okay. But I was really teasing an idea in my head. Ten years ago, mm -hmm. I was younger, just mm -hmm. don't judge me now. <laughs> <But I> Never. <laughs> I was teasing this idea of, can we really create a ritual and what does it mean? Mm -hmm. So if we take elements that are existing, like fish mm -hmm. and uh, sewing, which mm -hmm. is very, very popular in mm -hmm. Palestine, but if we change um, elements mm -hmm. and film it in a way mm -hmm. that could be believed, mm -hmm. what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Really, and I was teasing my brain with mm, this, and mm. I made it, and I was, uh, whenever I show it, the first question from the audience, is this a ritual you do in Palestine? Mm, mm. And I was so happy <laughs> with this question because I said, it worked. <laughs> like, I can create rituals, yes, no? Right. So I, I did. <laughs> combine rituals as, as well. Yeah, I mean, I, it was very compelling to watch this, you know, this... Uh, and, and it's interesting that that uh, you bring it back to Penelope in in the uh, in the Odyssey, right? Because she is also um, sewing, every, uh, waiting for her husband to come back. And in a way, if you at the end of your third film, that song at the very end, when they 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 say waiting for the beloved to come back and say that you, you won't come back, it really connects it back to this idea of a place where there has been a lot of death, right? Um, but there's always always someone waiting, you know. So maybe you can talk a bit more about you know what uh, how your village in a way inspired this body of work or the explorations which I can which you know I think we can feel you're you're going towards and uh, this, this ritual ten years ago to now I think uh, the lens looks like it's widening and you're looking at the landscape a lot more. That's really nice observation. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, it's true that in the real, in, in Penelope and the Odyssey, the woman is um, sewing uh, in the morning and unsewing by night. And for me, this is where the said this sewing thing is really interesting, because it's very repetitive, and she is uh, pretending uh, or doing it and then undoing it, uh, because she doesn't want to get married. She was waiting for her husband to come back from the war, uh, from the war and um, I forgot now the real story, but w she said whenever I, I will finish sewing this uh, uh, shroud, mm -hmm. then I can, you Get know, married. I will yeah. stop waiting. Because yeah. all the suitors from somewhere else had entered her house mm -hmm. and said, you must choose one of us. So in yeah. a way, it they, colonized her. Yes. A home, hadn't they? Yeah. So for me, this uh, figure of a woman that mm. is very strong, and mm. she she found a way around mm. to pretend and mm. then undo, to mm. do and undo. Right. There's a lot of repetition, strength, um, fighting in a very interesting way, mm -hmm. you know. And this really inspired the first film. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to always wait for a hero figure, right. uh, for someone to come back? Mm -hmm. I mean, I was thinking politically mm -hmm. in Palestine, right. and uh, I was amazed by the strength of the woman mm -hmm. figure. And this is how it came about. Mm -hmm. um, to go back to your question, I think um, working with the surroundings, let's say, is uh, very essential in my work. Um, so my house, uh, my mom, my mom is also in the second film, one of the people on the floor, uh, my cousins. Um, so in the second film, I go to the village next to us. And in the third film, I go back to the same location and to the same location of the first film, the desert area. Same people, but they keep growing. Um, Yes, maybe it's um, it's growing in that sense, in the way I look at the landscape. Like, as you said, it's a wider lens, but also uh, wider, but also deeper. I want to see what's underground. 
Yeah, the sense of underground is very strong. And um, and you were saying earlier that you were, when you, in looking at the landscape, you're also aware of all the caves that are there and what was there before. Again, his history, what used to be a, um, a well or what used to be a, a body of water in a pool and caverns for storing wine. Uh, those people aren't there anymore, but in a way, the spirit of that place still remains. And I, I think that what you're trying to f to to do in your in your in your choreography, in your social choreography, is to bring it back. Uh, you know, so the whole idea of the um, the haunted present. You know, the present is full of not not ghosts, as you say, but spirits. I mean, the the sense of the past is extremely present still, and and maybe that's why again, when you say that. The act of resistance is to still say we belong. This is our, this we are here. You know. Mm. Um. Yeah. Um, we also, if you think of the how much uh, aggression uh, is there in uh, by the Israeli occupation on top of the land, and the sense of dispossession, the sense of loss, the sense of uh, destruction like literally uh, bombing, destroying houses and people fleeing forcefully. Uh, so what remains? Where do the spirits go? Are they exiled too? Do they flee also? This is really a question we talk about in cafes and bars. It's not like the spirit world is not like something far. It's um, we, we present. I, it's very present yeah. because there is a lot of... Um, forced uh, flee, a lot of death, a lot of, um, mm. as I said, destruction. Mm. So where, where does, what is the invisible world and how can it resist also? Mm. Uh, because it is with us, uh, mm. no? Yeah, yeah. And with all, the, um, with all the people who are unjustly killed, mm. uh, where do the souls go? Mm. Mm. Because uh, uh, in Islam, Barzakh, uh, the space between the life and death. Mm -hmm. No, so it's believed that the soul has to pass this in between space mm -hmm. before it goes to the final. Uh, you know, like limbo. To let go. Is it similar to limbo, or is it a hold? Is it a holding place? Is it a, or is it a, pa is it a passage? Passage. A passage. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. Um, I mean, this is interesting because I. I um, after I screened the last film, uh, I talked, a friend told me, uh, it reminded them of uh, this in-between space mm -hmm. and with the sound of all these uh, mm -hmm. uh, haunted spirits, mm -hmm. let's say. And for me, it's true. Where do people go? Mm -hmm. Because with, when you are unjustly killed, it mm -hmm. feels mm -hmm. like you're not ready, like it was not your time somehow to go with this... Um, Massive, massive uh, killings. Mm. So all these souls, you know, it feels that they're stuck around us, mm. of course, mm. and we want to also hold them, mm. or, um, or they're calling us to continue the fight, continue mm. to resist. We want to listen to them. Mm. So maybe I want to listen to them, yeah. and I'm trying to get closer to where I feel uh, they're calling me. Mm. And in the last film, maybe it was the mm. underground. Mm. So maybe this, you're documenting this for us to see as well, for us to see those spirits who are calling uh, to you, calling to other people in Palestine, and therefore for us to see also those, uh, to have a feeling of those spirits which, which are there. Uh, you know, and, and one of the things that you also talked about is um, that what is important to you is to imagine possibilities. So, so can, you, can you talk a little bit ab about this idea of imagining possibilities by, by making the work that you make? Yeah, maybe I mean it on uh, <coughs> imagining possibilities of social formations, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, through the process of making, a lot happens. Uh, and I always think, what does um, synchrony uh, affect? Uh, what is the effect of synchrony in movement and sound mm -hmm. in a community? Mm -hmm. Why people, wha wha like, you know, we have strong feelings when we chant the same chants or when we dance in synchrony. Mm -hmm. And what does that do? Mm -hmm. Can we use it in protests? Can we use it in like activism, social mm -hmm. action more and more? And I'm trying to see uh, the base of it mm -hmm. in daily life choreographies mm -hmm. that I get inspired from mm -hmm. in the films. Mm -hmm. I try, but I'm also thinking of it for uh, actions that I hope we do more on the streets mm -hmm. also. Well, maybe then you can tell us a little bit about your school of School of Intrusion, School for Intrusion, School of, of 
School of Intrusion. Maybe can you tell us a little bit about about that? Because in a way, that's kind of social choreography too, uh, but in the form of a school. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. It's a project. Uh, it's a collective. Let's say uh, I started with my friend uh, Lara Khaldi. We co-founded it together. It's um, as the name suggests, a school of intrusions. It's about intruding. Uh, so it is a school, but uh, a school with no walls and no uh, space. Uh, so we are a group of people who intrude in private and um, public spaces in the city. The main concept is how to uh, see the city as a common space, how to claim back some uh, sites. And it can be a street, a monument, a graveyard, a cultural institution. We go into spaces that call for our action. Is this in Jerusalem or in? In Ramallah. In Ramallah. Mm -hmm. uh, places that call for our action, um, or how to say, like we feel the urgency to intrude and to ask some questions because um, we started this in 2019. Now the situation is different. So I'm talking about that time. Um, there was a wave of, a, kind of a wave of a new liberalism entering Ramallah. And I was very interested in the intersection of direct colonialism with new liberal new liberalism, what does this intersection produce? And I always felt it is producing a illusion of the post-colonial. Although you are under direct colon colonization, but because of this intersection, it, the city becomes a bubble and as if we are in the post-colonial, but we, you know, so it, uh, I thought it's a kind of a colonial strategy to let people free uh, feel that they are free enough um, if you have a cappuccino with almond milk, you're good today, <laughs> uh, you know? It was a kind of uh, things, um, if, you don't, if you don't leave that border of that city, then uh, consumerism and capitalism is entering heavily, mm -hmm. and it was scary uh, mm -hmm. to witness that. Mm -hmm. So the, um, this is one of the lines that we were thinking while starting the collective. But how can we intrude in such, you know, a new cultural institution that really build, you know, you know doesn't fit kind of uh, the space? How can we intrude, intrude in it and really bring up those questions and, you know, our bodies, they, and, you know, to work around it? Or a shopping mall that was, uh, uh, under construction, so we went to the construction site and we held a session there, for example. This is a summary, it's really... I mean, you were telling me that uh, you, you, you did a school of intrusion in, in the public library and then they asked you to go because you were being too loud. And it was not a public library, it's a library of an institution. Ah, of an institution. Yes. So, that, so, but so, so we moved to the cafe right, and we right, held a session there. Right. Yes. And you also said uh, that you went to a graveyard. Um, and again, the, the person, um, just tell, tell that story about, about your attempt to have the school of intrusion in the graveyard. Yes, um, yeah. One of the sites we wanted to discuss was the graveyard and actually the class, um, um, class also in death or in the symbolism of death were graves. So uh, the guard told us, we were a group of 10 and the guard told us uh, you cannot enter, it's not a space for reading or discussing. Anyway, after half an hour, uh, he let us in. Mm -hmm. But for me, what was interesting that the idea of not letting go, of trying, of negotiating, of why we cannot enter, at the end he accepted and he became the leader mm -hmm. of that session. <laughs> For three hours he was talking and sharing and uh, the knowledge I we got from that person uh, was really... Um, there, the value of that knowledge I mm. can never get in reading an article or mm. in a book. So again, uh, yeah. the site's s specific knowledge, the locality, the, the knowledge that comes from people. Mm. I was reading the other day uh, how people are the school. And I think mm. this is mm. something I, I try to do in my work in general, mm. in the collective, mm. in the way I live. Mm. I don't know. Because if the school... Like people are a school because if we think people are the most that are grounded or related to the land mm. with all this knowledge they have, mm. you know, then it is who we need mm. to learn mm. from. Mm. 
Well, I think one of the things that you you talk about is um, is that storytelling is the oldest form of teaching, right? And if somebody knows stories about a place because they're from there or they have been working there, they have all the best stories, and that is a so you kind of try to understand the idea of knowledge in another kind of way. So that storytelling, maybe that's why I use the word myth making, because what is myths but these are things that we create, right? We create myths. And if somebody else is going to create another myth of consumerism, then you're going to counter, counter that myth by telling another myth and taking over the spaces where those myths are being created to construct your own myth and say, well, what is, what is the mythology of this place? What, what is really there? What's underneath? What's, what's below the surface? What's under the ground? And I feel like there's a lot of this about what's underground in, in your work, yeah, which is yes. beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I, th I think we should put um, us the floor f for any questions, but just uh, one thing I wanted you to talk about a little bit um, before I, I ask uh, people if they have any questions is the influences on your work. And you named two things which I thought were very interesting. One was the Palestine Film Unit which I thought was a very interesting influence in, in your work. And the other one was the, the work of Hussein Barghouti. So I, I, can you talk about both of them? Or if you only can talk about one of them, I'd really like to listen to your, uh, what you have to say about um, Hassan Barghouti. Because I, I, when I went to look at his, some of his work, I really felt a very deep connection between you and him and, and the work that you, that you make. Um, thank you. Yes, um, Hussein is one of my favorite Palestinian writers. Mm. Um, he died early, uh, but he left a lot of uh, books and words, and um, I think his uh, his words uh, influence me every day. Mm. On the way I see things in Palestine, on the way I think, uh, he writes um, from a sense of deep belonging to the landscape mm. and he comes also from a village near Ramallah mm. so this sense of the countryside the village these mountains it's very connected to me mm. uh, bec because of the you know we're not city mm. people um, yeah it's a deep knowledge and trust in the landscape and relating it to the colonial structure from mm. that essence from the sense, uh, like essence of the snakes and uh, animals of the mountain, mm. and connecting them to the colonial structure that mm. he says, uh, how could that colonial structure of a settlement touch the land or touch the history? Mm. Uh, touching history for me is uh, something I I keep thinking of mm. and I try to channel in mm. the work. Mm. Um, Yes, I don't know what to say more than to... Mm. In, in the site of the second film that you made, is it this film or, or is it this site or the first site where in the distance you can see the settlements, the Israeli settlements? You cannot see it. You cannot see the them from there. Okay. No, but are they, when you were filming, were they present? In the latest film, yes, it was very hard to find a corner. Mm. And uh, when I was editing, I found that part of the settlement is there and I decided not to use the footage mm. at mm. all. Mm. Uh, I cannot. Yeah. I don't want to recognize it. Yes, yes. If the film, because I mean, we make films, they become documents, they travel mm. beyond mm. us. Mm. So in 20 years, I don't want to see that part of the settlement mm. as recognized. Mm. I yeah I won't give it to them. Yeah, I mean th this is how you create your own sense of what is of what is Palestine, your own sense of what is Jerusalem, or in your own sense of what is your village, that, to exclude uh, those who have come and colonized your your land, right? Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah yes. Mm. In the first film, behind my mother, where she's sewing, uh, in the mountains behind that is Jerusalem. Mm. So that is there. Mm. I kept it. It's right. Jerusalem and right. yes. But settlements, no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th there was this line that actually from a, a novel, I think it's a novel among the almond trees, which this is the line that reminded me of your work, where he, sa where he says, tell her no matter what happens, if you visit me, I'll be among the almonds. Mm -hmm. And this, I love this idea that you know, no matter what happens, if you go there, I'm still there. Even if you can't see me, I'm still there, I'm, I'm still present. And I think that that's a way to resist, as you said earlier, to keep saying I'm there. You may not be able to see me, but that spirit of me is has been there for a very long time, and you will never get rid of me. And that's the thing I felt very strongly in your in your in your films. It's mm. a very nice uh, line. Yeah, really. Yeah, it's beautiful. 
Anyway, maybe I can ask the audience if they have any, any questions. It can be about anything. It can be about, um, yes, immediately, okay. No time wasted. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much for your films. They're so beautiful. And I'm deeply impressed by how um, you put everything into visuals. And if I were to uh, put one similarity between all, your work, all, your, all of your works, I could sense there's a strong relationship with the spaces. And I think there is something that is hard to get translated into visual, especially when I was intrigued when you say something about weight of feeling. And um, I just wanted to know, and I'm curious, like, how do you preserve that weight of feeling amongst you know, the subject matter in the visual, and even among your production team? ensuring like everything that you envision turn into um, what, what you imagine, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe it's about the relationship to the people and to the space. So no one is foreigner to the space or to each other. For me, this is very important to a way to start from. Um, the other thing is about, um, I don't envision necessarily, but I have a strong feeling about a feeling I need to feel. But it's also up to them. So it's not a one-way direction, I would say. It has to go through a loop of conversation, of who's comfortable, of understanding that feeling more than understanding or learning how to move. Because in a lot of movements, uh, it's very simple. They're just walking or holding something. It's not actually hard movement, unless just the dance scenes or laying down. Anyone can lay down, no? But how to capture a feeling for me? This is the hardest thing no, to do. Because movement is fine. And, but, you know, some person told me, I don't feel like laying here. So it's great, don't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my mom said, I want to lay here because it reminded her of something, and you know, very good. So uh, for me, it's about the feeling of, um, like, are we, do we understand, like, are, do we want to do this together, you know? Uh, and what uh, each uh, gesture, how, no matter how simple it is, what does it bring in each one of them, and if they want to relate to it and explore it more or not. So it's a very social setup that takes a lot of time to make two minutes, uh, but I enjoy it. So it's the capturing the feeling, I would say. Question here. Um, afternoon, thank you for being here. I just want to speak to that sense of liminality that the two of you spoke, spoke about earlier, that sense of being in between and you were talking about it from the perspective of you know death and, and dying, right? But what about the effect of that liminal space on the living? So when I was watching that, I noticed that sense of the minality, the waiting, but it created this sort of surreal, like atmosphere. And I wondered, you know, what you like, what you have to say about that, like the effect on the living. Uh, maybe I want to activate that liminal space uh, by movement and moving, so it doesn't stand still. It's not passive. There's always either sounds or movement coming from it, passing through it, uh, through it. So because I believe it should not be still, it has to always be in movement. Otherwise, uh, it gets, um, it dies. And I think there is a lot in there to solve. So I want to break it and uh, activate it. So we are among each other. The dead, the living, uh, we need to, uh, how to say, to listen to them and continue. So movement comes from activating that space for me. This is a real sense of beauty, but at the same time, I noticed this, these grotesque elements as well. Like, you know, sort of popping up here and there, like with the fish, the sewing together of the fish, the flies, the dead eyes, the, the weight, you know, the rotting bodies, right? So the, what you're talking about, the, 
the movement, the continuity of movement to kind of keep things alive. At the same time, you also notice that like with life, there's beauty and death as well. Mm -hmm. So did you, was that intentional, that sense of the, including the grotesque or, especially with the women, the, the movement of the bodies, you know, like how they were hanging like puppets almost at the end. The, the sort of like, you know, the den the less yeah. dense around the fire or the and when they were kind of moving down these stairs i think there were three of um, them yeah they kept dropping their torso uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah um okay with the um, with the animals and the the literal death uh it is intentional i think it changed uh, from the first film 10 years ago to now the first film with literal fish and sewing and how to move a bit from that. But yes, I wanted to, uh, I mean, I don't want to deny the aggression uh, and the violence we are facing every day. I don't want to create a romantic image, especially with this medium that is already romantic and holds a lot of nostalgia. And I want to work around nostalgia in a, because I like nostalgia, but I want to work around it in a positive, not positive, in a more, um, not a simple way. I want it to be nostalgic in sense of time and medium and all this uh, in relation to the land. And I want to critique it a bit because we are also very nostalgic and we become too imaginary somehow. Uh, so it, it grounds it. I want it to create an image that uh, holds, uh, like doesn't uh, deny or forget that violence and that death I wanted to touch that death even, um, how it's represented around us and what does it mean and all this. So yes, it is intentional and I, I yeah, I, I'm aware of it. And it changed in every film there are animals uh, in different ways. Uh, with the a scene that you mentioned, uh, the, they start with this uh, movement and then they go down. Um, Actually, this movement is inspired by goddesses uh, in caves. The women go like goddesses, uh, they will hold their hands like this. It's a kind of uh, glory or something. Um, dropping, yes. Um, I, I don't know if it affect. I don't know how you felt about it, but they are dropping and then continuing to open the shreds on the floor to move. So it was also a in between gesture to continue to something else. That's a question over here. Thanks so much for the uh, films and the work that you do. Um, there's a lot of element of resistance of around themes of power, violence, myth, folklore. And also the element of spirit. Um, I'd like to extend it a bit more out of curiosity in the sense that it feels also in the very wider sense that there is a, f a sense of the religious as well. And I wonder whether there is a kind of conversation, while it's communities, while it's history, while it's spaces, while it's resistance, while it's power, are there conversations or perhaps questions with or to God, in a divine sense. Wow. <laughs> um, I would say spiritual more than religion. Um, for me, yes. Uh, I'm happy you felt it. It's not something I talk about uh, directly in the film, but uh, it is something I am personally interested in, yes. So I see a sense of spirituality, um, yes, or creating the space for that, let's say. So thank you again, beautiful work. I just want to uh, uh, make this question about the process because I saw a lot of your family included. 
So I would love to, to know more about this process, if they are included always, or uh, you, you said my dad once, uh, he said you have to, to see this place and if this is something uh, usual or not. And I saw a lot of people from your family like making part of the, the film. And it's just, um, I, I just want to know like more if they are included or not, or there's like this, do you know, conversation about it? That's it. Um, totally. The film starts from the living room, I would say. <laughs> um, neighbors, family, friends. Uh, it's a method of work that I'm trying to not trying, that I started to do um, uh, unconsciously and I realized it later on that actually it is the way I work and it's uh, a method now that I want to uh, talk about and bring up and what does it mean to work with family and friends. And then in the last film is friends of friends. Like we need, I, we need two more people than my cousin said, oh, I will call my friends, uh, call your friends. Then they came and they were dancing at the end. These are her friends. Um, so there is always someone, how to say, for me it's important that on set, as I said before, no one is foreigner. Uh, at least if you are on set, you need to know one or two other people. That So there is someone to lean on that we are, we are friends. And for me, it's a bigger question of how can we see filmmaking as a social experiment and also as a way to um, to create social movement. Like, how, how do we create social movements? I don't know. Like, how do we bring people together? How does the ripple, uh, the circle becomes a ripple and uh, echoes further than this uh, setup of production? So I see it as a social rehearsal, actually. And it's very important for me to start from the core, which in this case is the family I come from, and how to spread it. So my sister brought her students, my cousin brought her friends, uh, I brought friends and new friends, and then, so now they are like, like two of them working together that I don't know that they would connect, for example. So this social rehearsal, I call it, is very important, and thinking of it on a bigger level of social political ways of gathering, organizing. Um, and are they excited about it? Like, let's do it, let's, uh, do you know? Totally. No, no one is forced. <laughs> no, no, it's very um, independent way of making. Uh, I always say it's like going out for a for a gathering on the mountain or something and spending the day together and during that day we film. So of course, like the, the camera person who is a friend of mine that shot all the three films, uh, we've been working together for over 10 years, like he knows his role. And before we go to film, uh, we go, we do meetings, we go to the set, I, you know, we know what we want to get. But on the day of filming, uh, no, no stress, it's okay. Like We need to also give the space for people to make mistakes, which uh, most of the time is better than the scenes that I imagined. So how to really organize an event uh, while keeping all the space for mistakes, glitches, um, other things to emerge, because otherwise it becomes boring for me also. If I have everything planned, uh, and we do one, two, three, for me it's boring as a director. I don't want that. I want to go and see what happens. I always say this, so I took the men all the way to the location and it did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> what to do? I had to be okay with it at the end. I mean, I tried, 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 but I felt there is no way in these men. So enjoy your day, and I just filmed, I improvised other things with you know, took some location shots, other things, and I had to rethink the whole scene. And it took months for me to reach that I would do it with women, not men. Where? I tried once, twice. So it's a um, joyful process and research for me. No, it's amazing that you can provoke like family and friends like all to like make art together. Uh, this is amazing. Um, 
think this is really great. Like everybody, team, family, <laughs> let's make an art. So this is amazing. Maybe because we don't go with the intention of making art also. Because I don't know what will come up, no? Like I'm, especially with the 16, with the analog, because you cannot see what you filmed. You have very limited amount on the reel. It's two minutes and a half on the reel. So it's very, very limited. And this helps in the rehearsal experiment that I'm trying to do. So we go with the intention of rehearsing, being together. Yes, I want to get out some feelings and scenes. Uh, but at the end, we cannot look at what we shot. So what do I do? And that, this is why I don't do digital also, because it intimidates the people. When you keep recording all the time and it doesn't work for the experiment I'm trying to do. So we cannot see, the films are in the bag. Then wherever I go to Europe, I have to develop them, but they have to cross all the checkpoints, the border, the Israeli soldiers put them on the scan, back and forth. So I don't know what happens with them. I really don't know, like in the second film, uh, they were burnt because of the scan on the borders. So what to do? I have to send them to uh, recover, uh, how to say, Re restore? Re yes, in a lab, like two labs worked on them to restore them. So for me, it's part of the process, the quality you see and the... Uh, but just to go back to your thing, that we go with the intention that we don't know what will happen. I think I'm, I'm very struck by the, by the subtlety of the way you make art that is resisting. I mean, so it's art of resistance, but it's very subtle, and it's, uh, and it's, and it's very quiet, and it takes its time. You know, we, we think of resistance as being a very hard, direct thing, but actually, I think looking at your work, we can explore the idea of resistance um, not being that, but the way that a community can be brought to resist can be in a very different way, in an enjoyable um, way that involves everybody as well, which is really beautiful. Sorry, I just just thought of that. Sorry. Uh, oh, any more? You. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Maybe we'll just take a call. Where's Rahel in terms of timing? There's a question. Um, shall I go? Hi. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Could I? Oh, somebody's having a mic. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you. Actually, you kind of answered part of the question that I wanted to ask, but I, my question is about censorship and reception. So you're talking about how your films were uh, destroyed at the checkpoints through the scans. What about getting to locations? Were you forced to go through checkpoints as well to get to your locations for filming? And secondly, being in Europe, what has the reception been? Has it been very much different in the past year prior to prior to last October? Were there is there still a lot of censorship and unspoken censorship in the spaces that claim that they support post-colonialism, but m their actions may be otherwise? Um, the first question. Um of course, there's a whole choreography to go around uh, locations. But as I said, I, um, the first two films are the village next to mine. So it's, um, I did not cross. Uh, in the last film, um, you know, so sometimes I smuggle uh, to some locations because of checkpoints. And sometimes I had to do a kind of permission uh, to cross for safety for the equipment and the camera person also. Uh, so it's a whole choreography and you never know uh, if there is a checkpoint today or not. Uh, this is what I mean, you cannot really go with a set plan that this is what I would do, one, two, three, this go. You don't know. You can wake up and, uh, the, I don't know, the city is closed or they put checkpoints. So. Um, for us, I always say, or I believe in uh, how to be open for improvisation, and I mean improvisation not in an elitist sense. I mean it as a necessity, not as a choice. We don't have the privilege that it becomes a choice today, I will improvise or not. And I mean it in 
in movement in inside the choreography and also in the choreography of getting into the location. For me, the whole life is kind of uh, performative in a lot of ways. Um, so, it's, I don't know, openness, uh, being flexible, and the, the knowledge of really going around and not letting go, and knowing how to, uh, like the woman who was uh, suing and unsuing, she did it quietly, strongly, uh, and resisted, resisted in her own way. And I think we, uh, by being on ground, you develop a lot of tools, to resist and to go around in the quiet way or subtle way uh, as one of the ways because sometimes we need to be loud also. Um, <laughs> intrude, yes. The second question was about Europe and the censorship. Mm. Uh, yes, I mean it's for sure. I mean, uh, first I feel very comfortable here, so thank you. Uh, uh, in Europe, depends where. Uh, before the genocide, of course, is different. I mean, this is this goes without saying that the um, uh, invitations, reception, everything is different. And um, I will just talk personally about myself here. Um, I refuse to, I myself refuse to show in places that are not um, very direct, um, clear about their position uh, in relation to Palestine. So I don't wait for the censorship to, I don't accept invitations if they're not clear. Um, Yes, some uh, some countries in Europe are different than others, um, but yes. So in terms of invitation, it comes from me, uh, who to say yes or who to say no. And uh, it's just, um, I always say, I mean, for us Palestinians, it's a practice for me to ask all the time, before the genocide, after the genocide, I always need to know uh, where is the funds coming from, what are the politics? Before the, um, I mean, after the genocide, it's tripled more um, because some places are vague and don't have clear. So I had to triple to be more direct in asking. Uh, but it's a practice that I do. The reception from the audience uh, in the places that I trust and I showed in, um, it just, of course, I mean, even even for me, the last film, uh, it has it had a different wait after the genocide. I mean, this song about the fighters, I chose it and I, I was editing before the genocide. But after, um, you know, when I first show it in March this year, uh, I was like, what? Like, it's, it just had a different weight, like uh, singing for the fighters, not coming back, but wishing them the wellness. Um, describing her body, how it stooped. Uh, there is a lot of hope and beauty and strength and the singing for fighters. I found it beautiful, but of course, even for me, I received the reception, even myself, it was different after October. So I think audience is more emotional, uh, respectful. I'm talking about places that I trusted only. Uh, but yes, there is a sense of respect and um, acknowledging. There's a question here. And, and question there. Hello. Okay. Yeah. I think you kind of answered the question about hope and beauty. I'm, I'm interested in your personal journey of healing that the filmmaking process brought to you as an artist and as a Palestinian, um, because a lot of the images and a lot of the a lot of the scenes here actually made me well up in tears, even as I'm I was sitting here, and so did the sound, so did some specific imagery. So I'm wondering, I mean, maybe I'm not making sense, but 
just as as an artist and as a Palestinian, like how how did that contribute to an idea of collective healing for you and your loved ones? Mm. Healing is something, but collective healing is bigger than what I can claim now. Um, it's so nice to hear this word, actually. Um, so thank you. Uh, making for me is the only way to um, to live or survive. It's my only tool. So I say that I make uh, not out of choice again, but out of necessity or urgency. Uh, so when the images come to me or uh, they start haunting me, it's a call for me to do them. And it's really, it's not a choice in a sense that they don't let go until I do them. So there is a sense of like um, uh, seeing and capturing and making, uh, I don't know if it's for the place itself, for the images I see, for the where does this come from. I believe it's collective in that sense that maybe I have the tools to do that. So this, uh, the collective uh, visible and invisible realms together, they, you know, they poke uh, this person as I poke other people to do other things also. Uh, so maybe I see it in that sense of the process when the making starts or the idea comes and the hunting starts. Uh, on set, on production, um, I don't know if it's healing for everyone on the set, uh, but for me the the act of uh, really rehearsing and being together and discussing all these rituals and uh, bringing some things from the past and traditions to uh, to the site, there's a lot in there. And uh, when people uh, in the last scene of the last film, when the three women are dancing, they were describing to me a sense of, um, they really went into the mood. So they were describing to me that more, and they wanted to do it more. And of course, with the analog, with the film is just, you know, two reels, three minutes each. It's nothing. But we stayed two hours there, and they were around the fire doing and doing because they, you know, uh, maybe I, my job is just to uh, start something or drop something, and you know, if the other bodies catch it and go with it, then I'm happy. They you know, they see their own things and bring it back to the set and the feeling of the dance, for example. Just want to, I think this one, one last question, I mean, just connecting to this question earlier about, um, uh, it, you've just said that you, you won't do work uh, or, or be, go to a place where, you know, the funding comes from a place which is, um, that you won't accept, right? And I think that we're aware that nowadays, of course, Palestinian artists um, are losing their funding from a lot of places or don't want to accept funding from certain places. And I think, I, I know there's a question over there, a, a comment over there from Anne. Um, maybe you can, you can bring this up, Anne. Yeah, um, first, thank you very much for the films. Um, and I'm very, I think it's very moving to hear your own artistic practice and, and what you do in a very personal sense. I noticed that um, uh, you've worked with uh, popular art collective theatre, popular uh, Popular Art Center. Center, yeah, yeah, yeah Palestine, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I believe they have, they have now become part of um, something called the ONE Initiative, which is, um, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the Arabic properly, but it means like something like Gotong Royong, you know, kind of um, people coming together to to clear something, to solve something together, and this is, I think, it's about thirty. Um, civil society organizations in Palestine. Um, most of them are arts and cultural organizations, but they've come together for the first time, as I understand, to uh, basically raise funds for psychosocial workshops for oh. healing, um, and also to raise funds for, um, basically to, to help ensure that arts and cultural organizations like Popular Art Center continue. Um, I'm just wondering, is, is, is that the first initiative in your mind? Because they are refusing, they pointedly refuse to take any funds from any governments complicit in the genocide. So that means discounting Goethe Institute, British Council, and other um, European-based, where the arts and culture on one hand, and then the other side is 
weapons. Is it the first initiative that you are aware of in this way? Um, no. In Palestine, there are initiatives, but the Popular Arts Center and also the uh, Palestinian dance troupe that is also credited twice in two films, uh, I mean, they're very famous for being so uh, militant about that, which I adore. Uh, because before the genocide, yes, a lot of the, the NGOs, Gote, French Institute, this is heavily uh, in Palestine, no? in as many other countries, but it is a, the culture mm, became like an aid, an aid culture, uh, the cultural sector. Like we always had to wait for the fund to come from Europe or the no. So um, some places refused that from the beginning, and since the genocide, now uh, a lot of people don't work with uh, Gote and the friend like. I don't want to mention like only these names because they're the most famous, but uh, we are refusing to take money of governments that are, you know, especially in as an office operating in Ramallah or Palestine, it's more because it works directly with the people, uh, the locals there, so that the, the, um, the link is very direct. But yes, the, yeah. uh, did I answer it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Well, maybe I just, just say that Anne is part of an organization called... Uh, well, the full one is Persatuan Penulis Berbilang Bahasa, which is basically multilingual writers. Uh, it's Pen Malaysia in short, so it's linked... Oh, uh, and I was thinking more about the, the organization you're working for, for to raise funds for Palestinian artists. Yes, yes, sorry. So, so Pen Malaysia is involved with uh, PACSOC, which is a new initiative by a South African playwright, uh, which is the Palestinian Arts and Cultural uh, Solidarity Collective. Um, and that is something that has started up, um, and we will hopefully be hearing more about it in Malaysia. Yes, yeah, so I think what we're seeing is that, you know, as, as these other organizations, as Palestinians refuse that, that, uh, that funding, there are other organizations which, you know, people want to contribute towards those organizations and it becomes a kind of, becomes a, again, a community, right? It becomes a community movement where people from other countries will support Palestinian artists because those big institutions shouldn't be supporting them anymore because they are complicit in the genocide. Um, yes. And yeah, I, I just think the uh, things should not remain the same, no? For all the art world, cultural worker, workers, all of us, like Palestinians and non-Palestinians, I think if the genocide did not change us, then what will, no? We need to rethink our relations with who we work with, where's the money coming from, the whole art world market, uh, it's based on what? It's these questions should be asked now, because if not now, then when? So uh, it's an invitation for all of us beyond Palestinians, because we are thinking about them, and I think everyone should. No? Okay, I, th I think we, we don't have time for any more questions, but maybe uh, what I'd like to do is just ask you, this is some final words you want to say before um, we, we, we wrap up for today. Any final reflection or thought that you want to share with everybody? I think the last thing I did maybe was something that we need to rethink. Uh, we need to act more. We need, it's the time for action, uh, for things not to be normalized. Um, Yes, so I, I call for action in, in our own ways, but uh, we should not, uh, we are different people now. We are not, we should not be the same as a year ago. Can I just say something, just briefly? I just want to thank you for your very deep and soulful sharing. I'm engaged in writing and research myself, and I can fully relate to what you're saying about the openness, the flexibility, and the dealing with the unexpected circumstances and responding to it. And I think it gives me a good idea, and especially the idea of the school of intrusion, captures, has generated a powerful feeling of what's going on in Palestine, and gives us an idea of the, the source of the resilience and the courage of the Palestinian people. So a deep thank you to you. Thank you. And to the Greek for organizing it. 
It's a, it's a lovely way to end this session. So yeah, I just want to uh, just end by saying thank you so much to Rahel Joseph and to um, Ilham Gallery for hosting this and that the films will be showing uh, for the next two weeks. So thank you. Thank you.